Welcome to Liquid Margins, and this is uh, Social Annotation and Teacher Education. I'm going to introduce today's guest, and then I'll turn it over to our guest moderator. Uh, we have Lysandra Cook. She's an Associate Professor of Education at the University of Virginia. Matt Yauk, he's an Instructional Specialist at InfoHio. I like saying that, InfoHio. It's fun. Probably said it wrong. Um, and Charles Logan, a doctoral student in learning sciences at Northwestern University. And Ramey Kalir, he's an assistant professor of learning design and technology at the University of Colorado, Denver. He's also our inaugural hypothesis scholar in residence. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Ramey, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, and maybe you could ask the guests to introduce themselves and talk about their backgrounds a little bit. Thank Thanks so much, Franny. And greetings everyone who's joining us. As, as I look at the list of attendees, it's lovely to see some familiar faces and also many folks who are new. Um, and I'm gonna really step back and get out of the way. And so if our three um, invited panelists can tell us a little bit about their professional background and briefly a little bit of what they do as teacher educators supporting educator learning or how they work in the field of education, we'll go around and maybe um, Lysandra will we'll begin with you. Sure, um, thank you very much. Um, like they said, my name is Lysandra Cook and I'm actually um, an associate professor at the University of Virginia and the um, coordinator for the special education program. So I'm a special education um, faculty member and I have been here at UVA, this is my third year. Before that, I was at the University of Hawaii for 13 years. And um, I teach method courses predominantly for future special educators as well as future general educators um, that are, of course, going to have students with disabilities in their classrooms. So um, we try to integrate as much as possible. I would say that uh, we're still working on that <laughs> in terms of fully um, collaborating at the university level. Um, do you want me to, I know, isn't that a crazy move from Hawaii to here? So that was, <laughs> it's been a, it's been tough. Um, just brief introduction now and then come around to how we yeah. Thanks, Lysandra. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We'll come right, right back around about a little bit more about your teaching practices. Matt, uh, welcome so much. Say, say hi. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so my name is Matt Yauk. I am coming from Columbus, Ohio, USA. And I'm currently a instructional specialist at InfoHio, which is basically a giant digital library for uh, all Ohio educators. We offer a bunch of openly licensed materials, things that are more sort of premium and uh, provide them at no cost to Ohio's educators. So one of my roles is actually rolling out a new platform called Remote EdX, which is going to uh, basically combine a lot of different research, uh, different um, strategies, tools, and just stuff for remote learning and hybrid learning for all Ohio educators. So I'm excited about that uh, and to be doing that work. So thank you so much for having me. That's brilliant, Matt, thanks. Charles, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Logan. As Franny said, I am a first year doctoral student in the Learning Sciences program at Northwestern University. Um, prior to starting graduate school again, uh, I uh, worked at The Ohio State University, actually with Matt. Um, I was an educational technologist in the College of Education and Human Ecology. Um, and then prior to starting work in higher ed, I was a high school English teacher for about nine years. So i um, excited to be here and, and to think about the ways social annotation can um, support uh, teacher education. Brilliant. Well, it's really lovely to have all three of you here. And so we're going to really just open up the conversation now with a question that concerns, as, as actually as Charles just mentioned, social annotation, of course. And I'd love to know a little bit from, from each of you about how you first encountered social annotation. But, but beyond encountering social annotation, why has it, why is it stuck? Why is it for you a valued practice as a teacher educator, as someone who supports educator learning, and of course, as, as Lysandra mentioned a moment ago, to then ultimately support educator practice with their own students. What is it about social annotation for you as a teacher educator that is valuable? 
I'll take a first stab at that. It's a pretty broad question. I actually first heard about Hypothesis on Twitter. So I, I tell a lot of my doc students, like Twitter is a really great way to connect with other educators and even those educators that sort of overlap with what you do. So you're not just completely siloed. So I saw it on Twitter. I was really frustrated with um, when I moved to UVA from Hawaii, I had to teach online asynchronous for the first time in a while. And the discussion board posts were just, it was really hard to kind of facilitate deep thinking, but also social connection in those courses. And I saw it and I thought I'm gonna give it a shot. And um, it was maybe the fall of 19. And oh my gosh, the hypothesis team was so amazing in terms of answering my questions. It was before we had the integration with Canvas, they were, or right at the beginning, they were so helpful in terms of getting it to work. And the students' responses, there were a couple that had tech issues, um, but the students loved it and loved being able to kind of compare their ideas and thoughts with their peers in a way that was easier than regurgitating it into a discussion post and trying to, so it really helped them right there in the meat of the article to be able to engage in a way of, and have discourse around certain topics. And I think over the years, I've not that many years, but over the years, I've gotten better at picking specific articles to annotate for specific outcome objectives and matching those a little bit better. For me, that, that was a learning curve. But the, the social aspect, but also kind of the reading comprehension checks <laughs> have, been, have been really beneficial from my perspective. Um, yeah, so I, I can speak a little bit about the my, my background with with annotation and um, I used to be a, a classroom educator so I, I taught business and technology for a number of years at the middle school and high school levels and it I actually found out about this website called rap genius from a student who was competing in a marketing competition and he had apparently worked on this site and helped develop it and promote it. And when I finished that competition I was judging it at the time I went on to it and I was just floored by the possibilities that annotation could provide. And in this case, Rap Genius was basically trying to make sense of lyrics that were, I, I think more maybe exclusive. I felt like I wasn't just a part of the club. I had no idea what you know those things meant. And this site basically provided context and meaning for lyrics. And I thought that was just a brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, and in that sense evolved into just genius.com now. But when, um, I started to work in more of like the ed tech realm and I, I eventually made my way to Ohio State as an instructional designer and then eventually the academic tech director for the College of Education and Human Ecology. Um, my role started to shift a little bit in, in how I can basically prepare other teachers and, and help others sort of make sense of all of the stuff that they have to teach with all of the competing demands. And I, I guess stumbled upon um, hypothesis because I was looking for ways for commenting features, basically like Rap Genius. That's exactly what I typed into the search and eventually made my way to um, Hypothesis. Um, so I, I kind of felt it was the same. I had the same feeling actually when I first started using Hypothesis. It, um, I remember, you know, first starting off in higher ed, um, reading in higher ed. I mean, you know, my my undergraduate degree even. Um, I remember reading research articles where I felt the same sense of. Um, maybe just disconnect. Um, I didn't have the full picture. I didn't have the full story of what people were talking about. I often found myself going back and forth between the references and where people were talking about something. And I, I realized that, wow, annotation could actually help this and actually provide meaning right there uh, in front where it's just in one view. Um, and it's it ended up becoming like a more sort of rich discussion almost with the text. It wasn't just me reading it. It became uh, this sort of life form, if you will. So. Um, I first um, discovered Hypothesis also on Twitter. Um, and at the time I was teaching um, ninth and 10th grade English. And so as a teacher, I used it as a way to think about um, breaking down rhetorical moves in that authors were making in op-eds in order for students to identify, you know, how to do that in their own writing. Um, and then when I moved into higher ed and became an educational technologist and um, was working with faculty on developing their own um, pedagogy and how that related to technology, 
um, I would often lead uh, professional development experiences. And so one of the things that um, I think is powerful about social annotation with teacher educators is especially as we moved online, um, is to think about, uh, you know, we would annotate an article um, on how to build an online community. At the same time, we were building that community with um, social annotation. And so there's a way in sort of functions as sort of like a, a meta technology and thinking about the meta discussions of, you know, here's, let's talk about this article, but then let's take a step back and think about how would this technology help me as a teacher? And so I think um, combining those two conversations is, is something that I think social annotation allows you to do um, with your, you know, with students who are becoming teachers is how, you know, read this thing, we'll talk about it, but then that, that other conversation of how does this technology actually support your pedagogy um, or how, how might it, um, you know, further your, your goals as an educator. Charles, I appreciate that. First of all, thank you, you know, everyone for giving us a bit of that kind of personal history with annotation. I always enjoy hearing kind of where people learned about not only particular tools, but also communities and practices. Um, you know, as you mentioned, Charles, you know, there is a kind of meta quality when perhaps pre-service teachers or in-service teachers or faculty educators are engaging in social annotation activities. Um, there's often that kind of almost reflection on one's practice as one is simultaneously engaging in the practice of social annotation. And yet, while that may indeed, you know, be a true characteristic, it also perhaps varies by discipline or perhaps by pedagogical goal. And, and you all represent very different disciplinary uh, homes and perhaps have different discipline specific either methods or really kind of goals for working with educators. Um, and it may be illustrative for all of our guests today to hear some specific examples or some specific stories of the ways in which you've set up and facilitated social annotation activities to really support um, a, a discipline specific practice or a very particular type of learning either experience or outcome for your students. What does that look like in your classroom with your learners who again are, are also educators? I can go first this time. <laughs> um, so I think um, going back to sort of the designing the reading experience um, with the notion of let's let's discuss what we're reading, but also to model how you might use this in your own classroom. So um, you know a, a common practice with social annotation, right, is to seed the uh, the reading with questions um, ahead of time in order to generate. Um, you know, some maybe more focused discussion. So again, with this piece um, is by Jesse Stommel about, you know, six different theses for an online classroom, it became, you know, see those questions or see the reading with questions about, you know, how, how would what, you know, Jesse is saying here relate to um, your own classroom or what questions you have about how would I do this in my own classroom. Um, so at once it's a discussion about the text itself, but then, you know, I think um, what the challenge often, I think, with, with any technology that's happening in a digital realm is then how do you bridge that with your own practice? And so I think offering people an, an avenue or pathways to say, here's how I'm doing this, but being also very intentional about that going into it as a, as a goal, as a, you know, instructional designer or as an educator of educators. Um, is one thing to consider um, and how I found to, yeah, have maybe more rich discussions that don't just, are not just limited to the text, but can sort of um, spread out from there. Yeah, I, I, I oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, I, you, you asked like, you know, what disciplines I think would be, would be good for this. And I, and I would say maybe all, uh, all of them. Um, I think we're all kind of in the same field of we're, we're we're always teaching someone something. I don't care what like field you're in or what career path you've chosen. Most likely you have to teach someone at some point in your career. And I think with that comes um, answering questions and sort of th this idea of like correcting maybe misconceptions or elaborating on certain things. And I think annotation can, can help do that. So I think uh, a practice that probably applies to any field or any uh, area of study 
is the idea of having a conversation with the text that normally wasn't possible before. Um, you know, you let's say you're an online teacher or teaching online students at this point, and you are assigning a text. A common question that we always got as like instructional designers was, um, how do I know that students have done this? Or how do I um, know that students understand what I'm presenting here? Because a lot of classes, they are really text heavy, a lot of research articles, a lot of websites. And, you know, I, I would say that, you know, annotation is a very quick and easy way to, number one, is find what people are thinking about the text to know that they're doing it. But uh, I think more importantly, expose like how they're thinking about it and where they're at um, in their learning. So in a way, it's uh, it's very it's a very like easy to use formative assessment um, by basically presenting it in a different form by, by sorry, presenting an article in a different form, uh, it becomes this entirely different, uh, um, almost like assignment or a practice that's it's not one dimensional anymore. So I, I would say that's like the nice and easy way to, to, to get going with it. Definitely. I, um, I think drawing what Charles has said, I have used it in a way that they are um, coming back and making connections. Cause I'm always trying in the discussion throws, try, you know, try to connect this and this and that. If you find the right <laughs> kind of article that lends itself well, it can be that piece where they are annotating and saying how they connect this piece, especially I teach classroom and um, behavior management. And um, it's really nice to bring in some kind of equity or social justice pieces and have them specifically say some of the very explicit routines and practices that are research-based about what you should do in your classroom, how those directly lead to equity or social justice in ways. And it's taken me a little while to kind of find the great, <laughs> a piece for each of my courses that um, allows that kind of summarization and connection. But I've also used it really well. Um, I teach collaboration and methods for special educators and speech pathologists. And we take general ed curriculum and I give them kind of a set of IEP objectives. They go through and try to align like here's right where I could be hitting this, you know, standard for the gen ed setting and embed this IEP objective and it allows them to kind of be a collaborative team on the curriculum and embed specific things. And then also so, um, I go back, we go back through that same curriculum and then say, well, what would the pre-teaching or intensification for students with disabilities look like before this lesson? And they can kind of talk and collaborate about that. And it's been a really useful tool for kind of a different service provider is trying to look at curriculum that would be used in the gen ed setting and say, how are we infusing specific specially designed instruction or speech pathology objectives within that? And it's been a pretty helpful tool for that because those curriculum tend to be really big and overwhelming, but it, it's the one place where I can give them a large PDF and then consistently across the semester sort of keep going back to it and delving deeper. And it's been a really nice, nice tool for that. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you so much for those examples. Charles, did you want to jump back in, please? Yeah, I, I think one thing I wanted to add, and I think that connects to what folks are talking about too, is thinking about the ways in which disciplinary thinking can be made explicit. So what does it mean to read like a science educator, like a middle school, you know, math teacher that um, as more experienced educators, we can model that um, in our own annotations ahead of time again. And then again, as sort of a scaffolding and then, you know, be um, taken away over time. But I think, you know, someone who's reading a lot of peer reviewed research these days and just is like, go and read this, um, you know, I think there's a, a way of, of, of thinking and reading as an educator that social annotation can then make explicit and that the students can then also share their own thinking as you know, a social studies teacher um, then then allows for both their peers to see how they're thinking, but also as you as their, as their teacher to see and comment on too. So there's a way of you know, metacognition and feedback are operating um, as well. So I think there's, um, again, another, um, I think, powerful way to use um, social annotation. Charles, I really appreciate that. Matt, please. No, I, I just kind of wanted to, uh, yeah, piggyback off of what, what Charles just said there. And yeah, totally agree. Like the, the modeling of it specifically is super important for educating educators because 
you know, we don't want to just throw random tools at, at them and just expect that they know how to integrate it into the classroom. Um, the course I teach, which is uh, both intro and advanced software for teachers and trainers, um, how I constructed the lessons that use annotation, um, it's, it's basically embedded and it's setting it up correctly. It's, you know, providing the um, the documentation or the the video on how to use it first and then um, and actually modeling the same you know behaviors that I would expect of them and um, basically setting the stage for how to use it in their own classrooms. Um, so hopefully that's providing a little bit more context of, of how they might be able to integrate it and in some cases how easy it can be to uh, to do that. I really appreciate these comments. Thanks so much for everyone just for riffing now on you know these ideas of making thinking visible and the value that students have, whether those are younger learners or again, educators of making thinking visible to their peer cohort. But then also as teacher educators, we are committed to making our thinking as Charles was saying in a kind of disciplinary lens, visible in a, in a particular way, all of which requires on our part as teacher educators to you know, really be aware of our own teaching practices and to then be also kind of maybe critical and very reflective of, of what we're also learning about our practice. Lysander, you, you mentioned actually if in, your, in your introduction or one of your introductory comments that you've learned now over a number of semesters that perhaps certain readings or even setting up certain readings may be more useful for certain students in certain ways. And that got me thinking, I'd love to hear from all of you about some of the lessons that you're learning as teacher educators about how to, again, really effectively support your students learning, again, other educators learning through social annotation. What have you all learned about what either has worked well or maybe what didn't particularly work well um, that then may be of value to whoever may be watching this webinar, other educators, but certainly maybe other teacher educators as well. What, what are some of those lessons? I think it's sim similar to um, anything we're doing in education is sort of remembering what is our outcome objective? What are we trying, what are we working towards? And then are there potential barriers to get there and designing the you know, experience to meet our outcome objective? And I think at the beginning, I chose some readings that were probably too complex without supporting the students enough to get there. And I found in some courses, um, the connection, what I was hoping to get was that kind of deeper connection piece. And then in other courses, I'm actually using it as a reading comprehension tool. So it, de it depends on the objective to match the reading to that objective and for the students where they are in the, in the semester. Um, but that took a little bit of time. I think the first couple of times I thought, this is such a cool tool, I'm just gonna throw it at them. And then of course, like anything you do for teachers, it's not about the tool, it's about how you use it, what your outcome objective is. And so that took a little while to figure out. And it's okay to use this very flexible tool for different objectives, <laughs> but being clear about what your purpose is at any given time is, is definitely the um, lesson that I have learned. <laughs> yeah, and um, so I, I think, and this is complete credit to both Charles and and you, Ramey, um, using uh, a syllabus and having students annotate it. Um, that so Charles had shared the idea. Of, I think it was it was your thread or your article um, that you had written, and um, immediately realized the power of using that in the classroom because um, right away I got um, questions about the course. I got things that were maybe. Uh, just a little bit confusing, uh, things that maybe need a little bit more clarification or things that were just outright wrong and the points didn't add up and things like that. So I would say just as a practice, uh, something that I've learned is be very open to student input and the value of like sharing the construction of your course as you go. Um, it doesn't have to be one size fits all. And uh, I, I think that's positive because not every student is going to be exactly the same and not every educator um, is going to be teaching the same content in a lot of courses that they might be going through. So be open to that sort of shared collaboration um, just outside of the annotations but in the course itself is helping change and ad adapt to where they are too. Um, yeah outside of like just exposing the student thinking um, I, I think this is a community that has 
more than others, been very open in sharing their ideas and, and just sharing practices. Um, so I think that's uh, another important thing to mention is the amount of collaboration that you see just within Twitter or just within the hy hypothesis sort of sphere, if you will, um, that you can just learn and share and grow from. Um, one thing that I find very overwhelming is trying to uh, synchronously annotate with more than like two people. <laughs> um, I, I did that once, but as a participant and other, it just, I can't focus. And I mean, it's sort of like in Zoom too, you're like, oh, this chat's going on and this is, you know, we, so I guess if you're thinking about doing um, synchronous annotation, you know, one strategy that I found you worked well was to assign like one group annotate one thing and then another group annotate another and then swap. Um, but that is just like a social annotation 101 Charles thing. Um, I don't know if others <laughs> feel, I just, I don't like a lot of people annotating it once I feel like I don't know what to focus on. Hi, cause I've had student feedback that it was really good, but I had, what I did was I had it was a synchronous class. I had 18 people and they were, went with a partner into one breakout room and were discussing and annotating together, but everybody was on the same document, but they were also able to sort of chat with the person in their breakout room and they were very positive about it. But um, again, I think it was more of a checking and connecting. So they really were familiar. They had a lot of background knowledge and I think that helped then it was more of a conversation. And they they told me that they really liked being in the, it was like, I think pair share kind of a thing as best as I've figured out on Zoom because it's Zoom has been frustrating, but they did enjoy it in that place, but I haven't used it synchronously other than the, that one, one time. You know, this is so wonderful to hear your reflections and lessons learned. So first of all, just thanks for being both like very transparent and almost vulnerable about, about our, our practices as teacher educators. And it, you know, it strikes me that it's maybe useful to remind again anyone who is now or will be watching this webinar that that actually reflecting on teaching practice is is pretty rare, <laughs> uh, if I might say so myself. And particularly in higher ed, and I don't mean to you know give higher ed a bad name or or, or speak poorly of, of my own educator colleagues writ large, but uh, it's actually seldom for ed educators to reflect both critically but also kind of creatively on their own teaching practices. And so to hear, for example. You know the enthusiasm around a you know a genre like social annotation, and then more specifically a tool like Hypothesis, and to say, yeah, I want to use this, and it's just going to be great. I'm going to do all these things with it. But then to hear again, as as you said a few moments ago, Lysander, to say, well, hold on a second here, this is a very flexible kind of uh, repertoire of literacy practices, and it can be used in a whole variety of ways, and it can again align with certain objectives in particularly generative ways, and it may also not be useful, perhaps under certain circumstances. Actually, Charles, I, I actually really agree with you. Sometimes I find it overwhelming to have all of these, you know, kinds of, to actually see so much of other people's thinking so quickly. Um, I love the kind of asynchronous rhythms that slowly unfold as I may be reading a densely saturated annotated text. Again, I just think this is a really helpful reminder for educators and specifically teacher educators to just remind us all to think again, critically and creatively about how we choose to pick up and make use of um, a particularly generative social practice like social annotation. I'm gonna stop rambling because y'all know I could just keep going. Um, I think we're kind of at the point where um, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat here. There's a lot of really interesting conversation and questions that are, that are surfacing. So I'm gonna step back again. And I think that on the tech side of things, we're gonna have some folks step forward and ask some questions of, of, of everyone. Hey, greetings. I've been uh, lurking in the background on chat. I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis. Um, and we, we have been having a, a vibrant discussion there in chat and there's some questions have really surfaced, um, including um, one from Anthony Dunn um, that I thought was um, particularly interesting. Anthony, did, did you want me to, um, yeah, so I'm gonna actually, he says he's willing to come on on screen here. So um, I have pressed your button that makes, that allows you to talk. And if you wanna come on video too, I can promote you to be a panelist. Sure, go ahead. I think that did it. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, we can definitely hear you, Anthony. Awesome. Uh, Well, thanks for uh, fielding my question. Um, So I've used uh, Hypothesis on an Oops, sorry. I right right as Anthony was talking, I hit the promote to panelist button. Anthony, right when you were talking, I uh, hit the promote to panelist button. And <laughs> we missed the first part of it, so if you want to start over, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I've used hypothesis just a little bit, but right before the kind of the pandemic hit, and while we were in class. Um, so new to it, as in using it as a teaching tool. I teach history at. Pitt Community College in North Carolina, first year students. My real question about this is because as we're all kind of building our online classes and really more and more trying to make them very valuable experiences rather than, yeah, I mean, like it, we're really starting to hit online instruction at a very elevated level now, right? I mean, over the last decade. So we're all working hard to get our quality matters certifications and all of these different things. Um, and one of the things is is that I've been struggling for a long time with is how to facilitate valuable learner to learner experience in an online model. And I uh, completely abandoned discussion boards. I've I abandoned tests. Like I mean, I use my classes all written, very instructor, student, mentor guided things. But I want to facilitate learner to learner instruction. I do. Like I really want it to. And I think hypothesis could be a valuable tool. The limitation and Lysandra mentioned this was in a discussion forum sometimes it's very superficial you know we're all very busy they're very young students in their first year of college and it's like oh I got to do this post I got to respond to two people and you're trying to get a robust discussion how do my question ultimately to the panelists is how do you facilitate a deep discussion or maybe some tips pointers challenges pitfalls in hypothesis that social annotation to avoid some of that kind of like well just annotate two things reply to two people and get that kind of minimal discussion i think modeling is a big part of it um and my kind of plan is to drop little nugget annotations that are preloaded as examples but still what are your kind of thoughts on avoiding that or, or, or dealing with those challenges. And thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to start if, if, uh, if you all don't mind. Um, thank you for the question, Anthony. And I, I think like this is true of discussions, it's probably true of, of uh, annotations as well, is setting requirements for it, 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 it feels false because that's not what happens in the real world. If you were to pick up a book that has been annotated by someone else, you're not gonna like only do the thing, two things. You're gonna do all of the things that you that you like and and um, appreciate. So I would say start with the instructions. Start with you know um, I encourage you. I invite you. I um, yeah like it basically it's it's a very encouraging. It's a very open practice. It's it shouldn't be. Um, sort of a, a transactional. It, it shouldn't be like, you know, do these, do these two things and you get a grade. It's more of like the, the quality and, and engaging in the process. Um, so you, you mentioned like learner to, or I'm sorry, student to student interaction. I, I actually see this also as like a, a learner to content, which is rare uh, to get in um, a lot of different tools. So yeah, I would start with just being positive about the instructions, uh, framing it in a certain way. And then when you mentioned modeling, um, I try to be as positive as possible and as excited about contributions as I can. Um, and if, if, it's, if it's possible, maybe it's not uh, totally authentic or realistic to do, but I try to hit as many people as possible um, to, to basically catch them doing something good, catch them doing the thing that I would love to see and, and that hopefully helps spur the discussion more. Yeah, that I think building on what Matt just said, um, what I found in my online asynchronous courses is I have them in a home team across the whole semester. So they are really a small group of like six that really get to know each other. Some of the activities that they have to do are because it's say my teaching reading for, for special ed course, they have to do some practice teaching each other, do some reflections, the annotation pieces are part of it, but it's not every single modules kind of application activity. So there's variety. And I found a couple of sort of short enough, but dense enough pieces that talk about the science of reading 
that they can keep coming back to. So it's sort of like, here's your <laughs> beginning thoughts about this. Okay, now you've done these other modules, you've really got more background information. What is it, you've, what do you think about this now? Now you've practiced this teaching together. What do you think about this again? So they keep coming back to it, but they're with the same kind of group. And by building that, it's like, the discussion is not about your grade. It's about deepening your learning and your students' learning. And so they keep coming back to it as a way. And there's there are students that maybe would do more posts if I had, you have to do these and at least respond to three, but they wouldn't be as deep. So there's, you know, there's still some people that are probably not getting as much out of it, but the people who are really invested in it are getting more out of it because they, I've gotten them to buy into this is helping your learning, helping your peers, and they keep, um, but also having the variety so that the annotation isn't every single um, module. They've seemed to come around quite a bit about that, but it takes some community building at the beginning <laughs> and, they, and then requiring them to do things offline with each other and then come back. I mean, it, it takes work. And um, the other thing that I've been doing in Canvas that I love with the hypothesis annotation is every once in a while, I respond via video. So Canvas has that in the, in the speed grader where I can say, oh, Matt, that comment that you said. And somehow I think just as he said, it's Matt, it's really important to recognize what they're doing well, to give that really personable video feedback, even though they're annotating and it's a text base, they love getting that, they feel heard that way. And then you can see like even an increase in their participation again, so. It takes a lot. It's a lot. Online teaching is a lot. <laughs> the only little things I would add, I guess, are one is to just give folks choice. Um, so you may have types of prompts uh, and they may be specific to the text. It may be something, you know, connect this to your own life, connected to something that we talked about previously in the course or another course, um, rather than that mandatory, you know, identify the thesis and like the evidence, whatever it might be. Um, I think there's also, we haven't really touched on this, but um, social annotation doesn't just need to be text-based. Like students can respond with a meme or, you know, use hyperlinks. So there's like a really, there's a power in the multimodal nature of um, social annotation that I can, I think can also sort of add to the conversation that's happening. Um, I think it would be hilarious and amazing to see like a, a annotated just with memes or, you know, like just with gifts, like I would love to see that. Um, so yeah, that's what I got. <laughs> GIF, GIF only conversations, I love it. Nate, I think we may have uh, one, a few more questions perhaps that we want to bring. Yeah, well, I mean, you guys have started to touch on this already, but um, <clears throat> uh, there's been a little bit of conversation around grading and motivation really in the chat as well. And I mean, I know you guys have, have started to already kind of touch on that. But um, it have you found um, like through the use of grading or rubrics or other kinds of um, more structured <laughs> scaffolding uh, for motivation, if you will, um, that that's like an effective practice? I know that uh, you've already spoken a little bit to some of the more informal practices. How does assessment fit in? So teaching is tough and teaching online is even more difficult. Teaching during a pandemic is even harder still. So what I've had to tell myself is focus on the things that matter. And to me, the act of, of annotating the text is, doesn't matter as much as, let's say, you know, the, the culminating activity, the, the, the uh, thing that is going to showcase multiple skills, multiple pieces of knowledge that they have to sort of synthesize and put together. Um, they're going to show what they know in that activity. So I, I tend to stay away from uh, providing a grade on the annotation itself, um, knowing that, you know, their thoughts are going to come out and that that them doing it or not doing it is going to show later on. Um, so that's an effort for me to reduce the amount of grading for one, but then also it kind of frees people up to, to I think, personally engage more authentically and not have that sort of transactional, I'm going to do this many posts, or I'm going to reply to this many people. Um, that, that kind of removes that barrier, um, at least hypothetically. <laughs> so I think there's a way that you could um, ask students to reflect on their growth as a 
annotator as a reader over time in a course in which they have to return to their annotations um, and put them in conversation with one another and even with other students. I think that type of reflection is probably, I, I well, I yeah, it is going to be a more, uh, a better sort of window into their own thinking and growth for you, both for the student and for, for you, rather than um, you reading, you know, 50 annotations. Um, I, I don't think that's a good use of time. Um, so I think there are, there are ways of sort of stepping back and, and taking a look at growth over time and in which the students are using their annotations as evidence or even encouraging them to use one another's um, um, annotations in a paper or in a presentation or things like that where like the annotations, I think there was a question from Chris maybe about like where how else are the annotations? How can you return back to them? How can you make annotations live beyond just that text? And I think there are ways in which you can encourage students to um, think of one another as, as you know as as scholars who are you know drawing upon the 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 sort of collective knowledge that's generated. Um, so it's not just you know annotate this and move on, but how can those annotations live on um, throughout the course? You know, I, I, oh, Alessandra. I, I was just going to say, I don't grade them either. It's they do have to, kind of, um, at the end of the semester, submit kind of a professionalism um, self assessment, and that and all the discussion threads and things are, if I use the discussion threads or other kind of activities, are included in that. But it's more trying to get them to see this is, I think, like Matt mentioned, there's this other assessment over here, this is going to help you prepare for that. And so it's not graded individually. And um, the students, it doesn't seem to matter whether you graded or not, at least my students here. So I'm lucky that way they, they, there are always a few students that are, you're pulling teeth to try to get them to be involved and others that are super involved. And so I, I um, don't grade the, those kind of activities. Yeah, I'll just say actually, I'm thrilled to hear from so many teacher educators that, that, that actually not grading annotations is a useful means of then encouraging collective thinking for then other types of assignments for example, that, 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 that may actually be graded. Um, I would just also you know, echo that when I do work with educators you know, in a more formal teacher education context, like a class, I'll do a kind of similarly reflective act, um, assignment at the very end of the semester where I'll say, um, because again, this, these are all digital artifacts. These can be easily linked and extracted. You know, um, Show me 10 threads, for example, or a handful of threads that you contributed to, or again, some student or again, a pre-service in service teachers having exchanges with their peer cohort and then comment upon this thread. And again, a very kind of, you know, meta reflective way. How did this contribute to our courses understanding of or our courses learning about some particular topic? And I'll do that during a week or a cycle of learning, perhaps when there are no new readings, but it encourages again, educators to return to that social activity and reflect upon a kind of collective learning experience and, and how that was valuable. To them. Um, I know that we're just butting up on our time here. And so I just wanna say briefly uh, how uh, thankful I am that we were able to have Lysandra, Matt and Charles join us. Um, I know that there are some uh, a few more kind of like formal housekeeping notes that I think Franny wants to throw into the mix, but I just first of all, I wanna thank the three of them again um, and thank everybody who's been able to, to join in the webinar so far. But again, Franny, uh, let us know what else is going on. Well, actually, I'm just going to echo what you said, which is um, we are past our the time when we normally end. But this is such a great discussion. And if you all can stay and go on for a bit, and if attendees can stay, great. And if anyone has to leave, that's OK, too. But I mean, I'd like to keep the discussion going and keep the recording going. You know, there's a side of me that um, almost wants to bring <clears throat> Rosaria. Oh, there, there's one of the little helpers that Charles warned us about. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is Eleanor. Oh, hey, Eleanor. Greetings. Hi, Eleanor. <laughs> Wave to Eleanor, everyone. <laughs> That's such a great name. Um, I was just thinking, I just saw a really, um, so anybody who needs to leave, including the panelists, if you need to take off, no, no shame at all. Um, feel free to just um, disappear. Um, but, uh, you know, there's been a lot of vibrant discussion in the text, and a lot of it has actually come from Rosario, who uh, I'm really pleased to have here because um, I know she's been doing a lot of great 
work done in Mexico on social annotation. And I'm wondering, Rosario, would you be uh, would you be open to um, unmiking and coming on stage here to uh, to uh, kind of emphasize a little bit of what you've been saying in the chat? Hola. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's really nice to, <laughs> to be with you. No, I, I, I wanted just to share the things that I've been uh, working with hypothesis since um, two years ago when I found it through Twitter <laughs> and I just started to, to, I don't know, to, to start to look how it works. And then I just started to use it with my students here in, in, in Mexico. But at the very beginning, I, I had a lot of problems because if there aren't any or very few information or, um, of uh, this tool in Spanish. Then because of that, I started to make some uh, <laughs> resources in Spanish uh, just to help my students. Mm, then I, I recorded um, a tutorial with the things that I, I realized <laughs> because this is the first time that I'm, uh, I don't know, talking with the people who, who, who are related with this uh, tool and then I identify some ways, and then I I, I uh, made this um, tutorial in Spanish, and it was <laughs> it was so fun because there were a lot of professors or uh, uh, in, uh, here in Mexico and in Latin America that they asked me to to teach them how to use hypotheses that I'm not an expert on that, <laughs> but you know I started to find and but my my students really love this one, and the the thing that we um, that we have been thinking here in, in, in Latin America is that uh, it's a shame that uh, there's a very few information in Spanish of this because there are a big community that are interested in, in use it. And, and then for me and uh, for my, for, for, for there, we, we are, I don't know, four or five uh, 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 professors that we are using this. Uh, and um, the thing that um, we, uh, we started to do is, uh, you know, because of the pandemic, it's uh, very difficult for the for the students to go to the library <laughs> because no, it, it is so dangerous. Then the thing that we started to do was uh, to to um, um, open an open um, open group in Sotero, no, and all the the bibliography we put it there, and then uh, my students, the thing that uh, they look in the um, in the open group group of Sotero, and then they they link the information all of that in open access because it's very very difficult, um, because probably you can find this information in um in a subscription uh, uh, journal, but no not all the students can reach that information. Probably this is a problem. And then, uh, but my students love it. And then they just started to tweet and they to look for the authors in Twitter. But there, there are very few authors that answer the comments or the annotations. I don't know, probably because they don't know what is it, you know? And, uh, and the other problem that we have faced is that in my university, we use the Teams Microsoft uh, learning management system. And I really don't know how to link the, the, the Teams uh, platforms to hypotheses. And thank you very much for <laughs> for let me talk with my very bad English. <laughs> oh no, thank your you. English is <laughs> is great. Um, and I'm I was just so excited to see you here because you really have been a, a super big um pr proponent mm -hmm. and and evangelist for. Uh, I'm a big fan of hypothesis, so you're a grand fan of hypothesis. <laughs> yes, um, okay. and, and uh, especially on Twitter, and, and Twitter does seem to be one of the big uh, themes here. Like so many people uh, seem to have come across this uh, via Twitter. Um, so thank you all. For, thank you mostly, first of all, for all the work you've been doing in Spanish. Um, and just um, I'll just say that um, it is one of Hypothesis's goals to. Um, uh, you know, make the resource completely available in other languages. But I will point out that the annotation layer as it exists now um, is fully language capable, even different character sets, right? So when, even though the interface is in English, when you have people annotate, as I'm sure Rosario has, uh, has experienced, the annotations themselves can be uh, produced in any language, um, mm -hmm. including even um, 
right to left languages and things like that. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in the annotation framework itself to do that. And we can talk about the Microsoft Teams stuff offline because that's a really specific thing. Um, mm -hmm. I want to throw it back to uh, Ramy in case there was something else just as the moderator that you wanted to make sure we uh, we got across here. No, I just I think that the, the kind of the last point I'd like to make um, is just an appreciation for the enthusiasm that educators have about this as a social practice that is useful for learning. Um, you know, right now, and this echoes a number of comments that have been made, you know, we are teaching and learning in a social and dare I say also kind of political context that no one alive has ever experienced before. Um, and the circumstances that have been buffeting education, whether we're in Mexico, like Rosario, or we're online, wherever we happen to be, um, educators and parents, uh, as we just you know saw some 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 little little ones running through the room, and my little one might run through here at some point. And you know we're all just teaching and learning in such incredibly challenging circumstances. So to find rewarding and meaningful opportunities to connect with other educators, to connect with our students, and to do so through a digital and online format, I just find to be particularly inspiring. Again, in this particular moment, I also just want to say, without getting into too, you know too much of detail, that. There are, as I think many on this webinar, either now or watching this will know that there are many examples that we can point to of particular technologies, actual tools or organizations that build tools that are not, let's uh, say respecting um, the, the kind of well-being of educators and students um, in a variety of ways. And I'm not gonna point fingers or specific examples, but I think that we could all kind of dig out our, you know, our, our favorite target, which is all just to say that, um, again, hearing um, the enthusiasm that educators have, again, for in this case, a particular organization and tool that is very respectful of student privacy, for example, um, that in yes. particularly in the case of my work as a scholar in residence is approaching research from a very strong ethically oriented standpoint. Um, and to then speak with educators who I believe are making instructional decisions. I think, again, we heard today from, from Lysandra and Matt and Charles, as well as those who are asking questions. You know, these are all questions about instruction that is at heart respectful. This is about teaching and learning that at its core is really about supporting other educators and then having those educators support their students in a way that really honors not only the dignity, but also just the current circumstances of what we're all going through right now. And it just makes me very appreciative to be in conversation with educators, some of whom I'm meeting for the very first time today, who are so attuned to the moment and who are also aware that this particular community of practitioners and this particular genre, again, of, of literacy practices is, is in alignment with this very, again, ethical, equity oriented and respectful approach to teaching and learning and doing so right now, that is just for me very heartening. Um, and that's, that's what, what, what I wanted to say. Um, I have to run at the top of the hour, so I'm gonna just kind of leave it there, but just extend again my thanks to Lysandra and to Matt and to Charles for just being such stellar um, contributors, sharing their wisdom and experience with us. And so much to, again, the team at Hypothesis for bringing us all together today. Thank, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks. It was a great discussion. Um, everybody, uh, I, I want to give our panelists a chance to say goodbye at this point. Ramey, why don't you go first since you're going to have to. I mean, everyone, <laughs> thanks again. I really appreciate it. Good. I mean, goodbye, everyone. I hope you have a lovely day or evening wherever you are. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Yes, awesome. It was very nice to be here and thank you very much for the invitation and have a wonderful day. Everything that Ramey said uh, and bit by bit, change the world, help each other out. We'll get through everything. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. Those are such nice heartfelt words. Um, this concludes our show. Uh, come back next time. Um, I'm not sure what the next date is going to be, but we'll let you know um, as soon as we can, everyone out there in the community. And this recording will be available um, later today or Monday. So uh, I just, again, thank you for coming to Liquid Margins, and we'll see you all next time.